idealist who had been jailed and exiled for his part in the 1867 rebellion would have been a hero to Murphy. By referencing him, Yeats was contrasting an icon of integrity and idealism with its antithesis, Murphy. So he's saying the economically driven materialism and greed of Murphy and his ilk have, as it were, shoveled the dirt on top of romantic Ireland. However scathing Yeats's words, Murphy remained unrepentant. His battle for the heart of Irish nationalism would soon lead him to a far more extreme course of action, one that would taint his reputation forever. Murphy was now approaching 70 and Ireland's leading captain of industry. Though enormously wealthy himself, he was also proud of the fact that by his acumen, others thrived. In Dublin alone, his huge business empire provided much needed employment to thousands of working class men and women. For those who had jobs in a city where there wasn't many sort of factories apart from Guinnesses and Jacobs, getting a position in the Dublin Tramway Company was something to be protected and something to be defended. Generally speaking, Murphy paid better wages than most employers. I mean, the tramway workers, for example, were paid better than other unskilled workers or semi-skilled workers in Dublin. They were still very low by British standards, but by Irish standards, you couldn't say they were. And they are more than some of the Dublin Metropolitan Police. And However, this benevolence was strictly on Murphy's terms. To keep your job, there was one basic rule. No unions allowed. There is a very important memorandum that I found many years ago, written in 1913, describing conditions inside. It shows a very harsh regime within the tramway company. Conditions were quite draconian, very tight military type discipline. Quite minor breaches could be punished, for example, talking to passengers. If you arrived a minute early at Nelson's Pillar, that is in the middle of O'Connell Street, then you basically sort of were fined. There was also a system of informers on the trams that anyone who was thought to be a troublemaker was earmarked and gotten rid of. People did live in, in terror of Murphy and of the regime he set up. Murphy would now come into conflict with a radically different vision of Ireland's industrial future. Championed by a man whose defeat would become an obsession. The sodas son of an Irish emigrant who saw Murphy and his kind as anathema to the working man, James Larkin. Larkin wanted basically to change society. He wanted to create a socialist island. Larkin's revolutionary. I mean, let, let's be blunt about it. I mean, he, he really wanted a totally different economic order. In 1909, Larkin had founded the new militant Irish Transport and General Workers' Union, aiming to organise for the first time Ireland's mass of unskilled workers. Soon Larkin was turning his attention to Murphy's transport empire, boasting that he would unionise where no one had been able to before. A confrontation was inevitable. And it began on the pages of Murphy's newspapers. Murphy had access to not just the Irish Independent uh, and the Evening Herald, but also Sunday Independent and the Irish Catholic. And they were all brought together to carry out a concerted campaign to demonise the other side. Larkin was depicted as the evil genius, a revolutionary anarchist, anti-religion, anti-clerical, anti-everything, and uh, he's going to destroy the Christian life of Dublin and so forth. And saw it almost as a struggle between good and evil. Having prepared the ground, Murphy went in for the kill. He drafted a solemn declaration to be signed by all tram workers, promising never to become members of the ITGWU. And he systematically began sacking anyone he found in the transport union. And by the end of August, uh, most of them had been sacked that he'd, that he'd found out. And the workers who were left went to Larkin, who was ready for strike, and, said, and pleaded with him and said, look, you know, either you bring us out now, or there won't be any of us left to bring out. 
700 workers employed in the tramway company in 1913, 150 to 200 walked out and Larkin called them out. As president of the Dublin Chamber of Commerce, Murphy now urged his fellow employers to unite with him in his struggle against Larkin. He proposed that they use the same uncompromising tactic, the solemn declaration, as a means of driving out the Larkinites from every firm and business in the city. He then led an action which involved the employers locking out those members of uh, the workforce who would not sign that particular document. And in so doing, escalated the conflict in a way that maximized the suffering. Ultimately, I, I think I felt that the only way to win through was to bring the union to its knees. By the end of September, 20,000 men, one in five of the city's workers, were locked out of their jobs and deprived of their only source of income. As food supplies from sympathetic British unions dwindled, the strikers and their families grew desperate. With Murphy refusing to negotiate, hunger and disease proliferated in Dublin's tenements. The death rate rose sharply, particularly among the young. It was causing tremendous hardship to families and children. This is where the, the ruthlessness, if you like, of Murphy comes in. Call it an indomitable will, if you like, but the other side of it is, it's, it, it seems completely ruthless. He's exaggeratedly aggressive in his attack once he's decided that that's his enemy. Larkin now had an opportunity to focus the striker's anger on a single figurehead, and he did it with relish in the pages of his own paper, The Irish Worker. The Irish Worker was particularly savage in its treatment of Murphy. It referred to him as a tramway octopus, a tramway tyrant, blood-sucking capitalistic vampire. What Larkin is trying to do with Murphy, I suppose, is a reverse image of what Murphy was doing with him. He's trying to demonise Murphy. He's trying to show people that Murphy was an uh, antichrist, basically, that he was driven by greed uh, and that he was totally unscrupulous. He was a tyrant. Murphy was presented in a dehumanised form. Uh, he became 